we're going to talk today about microscopy and microbiology because Microscopy is the only way we can see microbiology because microbes are just so small. All right, so how small is a microbe, in fact? Well, to give you a sense of how small a microbe is, because I could tell you that a microbe is typically, so a standard bacteria cell is about one micron or micrometer. So you know how long a meter is, it's, you know, taller, well, not quite as tall as I am, because it's a little more than three feet, and I am not six feet. So, and then if you think about, if we go down from there, a centimeter is usually about the width of your pinky. A millimeter is a tenth of that, or maybe the width of a paperclip. And a micron is one thousandth the width of that, or the width of a paperclip. So these red blood cells here, they're probably about a hundred, a hundredth of the width of a paper clip. So they're about 10 microns. And then this bacteria is a single little micron. And this large thing here is a white blood cell coming to grab it. So that is a white blood cell going after a bacteria, which is really, really tiny. See how small these little bacteria are? Viruses are even smaller than that. So they are often even up to 100 to 1,000 times smaller than bacteria. So here, this large blue blob is yet another white blood cell. This one is a T cell. And each of these tiny yellow dots is an HIV, human immunodeficiency virus particle. So if I make the uh, white blood cell from this image as big as the one over on the side here, you can see that the bacteria, which are up here now, are much, much larger than the viruses, which are single particles about the size of my laser pointer here. So I can fit a lot of small little virus particles in this bacteria. Essentially, these things are very tiny and very hard to see without some kind of help, thus microscopy, which is why it didn't happen for a very long time. And when it did, it took a while to get there. So let's talk a little bit about the history. So in the late 1600s, we've got Van Leeuwenhoek who created this very tiny little microscope. It's got a single little bit of a lens there. You put a sample on here, you look through it through the light. And when he put a drop of water, like pond water on the lens, he was suddenly impressed at the number of tiny little things that were swimming in it. He said, oh my goodness, look at these wee little beasties. Although I think he was uh, from a different country. So he most likely didn't say it in English. And then sketched some of the wee little beasties or animacules that he found. If you've looked at any kind of palm water day, you might recognize some of these as various types of algae and diatoms, which are still fairly large. They're actually much closer to the white and red blood cell size than the bacteria size. But Van Leeuwenhoek did manage to catch some small things, and he sketched a few of those as well in some shapes that make it clear that he was looking at bacteria, even though we didn't really know what that was yet. And then later on, the microscopes get a little bit better. We get the capability of adding some more lenses, focus the light a little bit more, and we can see things smaller. And so this was a piece of onion, very, very thin slice of onion, in which Robert Hooke was able to focus and see what he called cells, because he said they looked open like the little cells in a monastery. And so that's where the name comes from. And we've got all these little cells in the onion. Of course, at that point, people still didn't really understand or know what was going on with them. And it took many, many years and improvements in the microscopes for us to be able to do so. But let's talk about what we can do nowadays with microscopy. So what you can do in our lab is light microscopy. We can magnify things up to about a thousand times their normal size. And then of course these images might even be a little bit bigger because I can expand them on the screen, but you can't get as nearly as much detail. And so you can see bacteria here these are little rod-shaped bacteria, any of them sticking together. These are little cocci or round circle-shaped bacteria. And the cocci are often much smaller than the rods are. Light microscopy allows us to see fairly well, but they're still very, very tiny. So if you think of each of these circles as the image you see with your eyes through the microscope, you'll see how small they feel in the lab. 
We can sometimes do our lighting in a different way so that we actually have a dark on the outside and the goal is to reflect the light off the objects. That's called dark field. And so here you can see doing a little bit of that with these bacteria now reflecting the light and the darkness going through. So you set up a microscope differently for that, but they're still just as tiny. And there's a number of other types of microscopy, including phase contrast and similar things that are still in this size category. But we wanted to see even more. So we have to go beyond light because getting light to bend and refract and fit to our eye and work is still difficult. If we keep trying to make things bigger and bigger, eventually they're just gonna look like blobs. If you've ever seen them on TV shows where they say, hey, can we magnify that? And they take the image and they blow it up and it looks just as good. That is not what happens for real. It blows up and it looks like lots of little colored bubbles. And that's what the bacteria were looking like. So we did some different things. We can do electron microscopy where we take electrons and we do one of two things. One is bounce them off the bacteria. So this image here is scanning electron microscopy and the electrons from a piece of tungsten are actually sent down to the image and then they bounce off the image. We collect the bounce and we're able to turn it into what you see. So you are able to see the outside structure, which for the first real time with bacteria gave us a good three dimensional structure of the bacteria because we can actually see how the electrons bounce from all different angles. I have done scanning electron microscopy. It is tough. It is almost as tough as transmission electron microscopy, the other side here where we send electrons through the microbe and either they go all the way through or they bounce off of it and we can make an image based on that. So which ones go through and then which ones do not go through. Actually, they, they tend to stick to the subject not bounce in this case. So if they stuck to it, it creates a bunch of electrons and that's the dark sections. So now we can start to see even more detail, even though we cannot see the three dimensions. So you kind of need both types of electron microscopy to understand. But we can see, for example, that there's a whole cell wall all the way around this. And so we start learning about the structures inside of cells with microscopy, because now we can zoom in close enough to see them. We can see blobs, but we can tell that there's no other membranes inside, which is where we get our prokaryotic, eukaryotic cells. Furthermore, electron microscopy allowed us to see things that were even smaller than before. So we can actually start to visualize things like viruses. So I noted that image you saw earlier, that was a scanning electron microscope. This is a transmission electron microscope. These are bacteriophages, which are viruses that affect bacteria. So if you think about this, this is that bacteria that is maybe a micron long, which actually means that its width is even less than that. So maybe a 10th of a micron across and these teeny, teeny, tiny virus particles are even smaller than that, but we can see them using transmission electron microscopy. Finally, there's a few interesting things we can do to use what we have to tag different types of bacteria. So one of the things you will get to try in the lab is differential staining, which is where we stain bacteria in such a way so that a stain sticks to some aspect of them, some structure, some piece of their cell wall, some extra piece sticking out and not to other things. So in this instance, this is a gram stain where the stain sticks to the bacteria that have a very thick type of cell wall, but the purple stain does not stick to the other type. So we wash away the purple stain and then we add a pink stain and the pink sticks to the ones that no longer have something stuck on them, but the purple doesn't allow the pink to stick. So we have two different types and we can say, well, these have thicker cell walls than these. We also add certain kinds of stains that show us the structures. So flagella are very, very thin and tiny and hard to see, but we can add a stain that sticks all the way around it, thus allowing the microscope to pick it up in some way. And finally, we can use fluorescence. So with fluorescence, we can actually add something to the microbe that will stick to it, that has a fluorescent tag, and then use UV light. If you put UV towards it, it will send visible light back to us based on the tag. So in this case, they've tagged them with different things. And you can see green would have one meaning, red would have another. Typically in the case of this, it's probably which genes or proteins are active. We can actually use fluorescence to tag certain sections of genetic code 
to snag different types of bacteria, which is good because, again, under the microscope, a lot of them look the same. So now you've seen some different things we can do with microscopy, and I hope you get a good chance to try out all these different types of microscopy in the lab as we continue to practice over the course of the semester.